today, not just popping in in person, trying to get the time zones right, but really <laughs> here <laughs> as the person who we're going to hear so much from. And Liz has so much behind her name. So I said, please, Liz, just send me something that I can kind of encapsulate all of that in and share. And I still feel like if it was a page long, it still wouldn't be able to share everything that Liz does and is and means for us. And I, I have to just put in now that Liz has been one of those pillars, I feel globally during lockdown, who has pulled people together from all over the world. And I'm one of those people who feel so grateful to be part of her, her clan. And um, yeah, Liz, it's just amazing your bravery, your courage to step out and pull people in and have everything from summits to events to small groups. But you've really helped so many people sustain their courage and um, oh just being able to think out of the box. So thank you before I even oh start. Oh my goodness. Up. I so we're just going to be crying at the beginning of this recording. Yeah, let's just stop and cry. <laughs> let's just start there. Let's just start there. Oh, well, thank you, Dana. That means a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, all true. Liz. And again, there's not enough words to say that. But um, Liz has always loved people and is, is constant in that area as a work psychologist former talent director and overall people practice maven. And a lot of these words, I feel like Liz has just brought into the internet chat. She works as a consultant in a role as chief talent navigator. Don't you love that? For transforming talent. So to this role and her clients, she brings over 15 years experience in global, yes, strategic and hands-on HR, talent and learning. She's been honored with multiple innovation awards. We are not surprised. She's been <laughs> designated a Franklin Covey benchmark. That is super impressive. And lauded for her work most recently as the mastermind of the L&D Cares Career Growth Summits, of which I've been so privileged to be part of and just to see the great work that Liz has initiated and, and grown there. So she's active in a variety of talent recruiting, learning and talent branding communities to give credence to the statement, careers look good here. Yeah. She publishes Transforming Talent Insights. She's a brilliant writer. Every time I speak to her, I just oh. think a lot more. <laughs> to carry the practice ideas forward. Um, she's actually currently employed in Austria, as you can hear, American and sitting in Stuttgart, Germany. So <laughs> testimony to how far her reaches. She's received her diploma, bachelor and master of science in work, organizational, cultural and pedagogical psychology from the University of Freiburg, Germany. This is where you can say she's really bad at decision making and making choices and so just does it all <laughs> and figures it out later. Yeah, yes. that's, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> oh, super creative. <laughs> and her bachelor of arts from the University of Oregon in German, luckily and anthropology, archaeology, so just oh, super deep on so many levels. She loves fostering connection, and I know yes. everybody here today, if you know Liz, you've experienced that um, in her private or work life, over food, over a complex problem, or over a laugh, and um, I only learned this recently, she's married to a German lawyer, which <laughs> makes for a good balance. <laughs> I didn't know he was a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> we we have those different poles to our personalities. Complementary relationships are always good, right? No, super helpful, I must say. Uh, <laughs> I, love it. I know when we were chatting, and um, I so much just wanted people to have an opportunity to hear your insights and your expertise. And um, as we were talking, and you talked about how important it is when work fosters a sense of impact rather than mm -hmm. task. And we yeah. say, yes, that is it. Because since the pandemic, people are so much seeking meaning and purpose in work. Yeah. We know how that's even filtered into a lot of behind what's behind the great resignation, which is now called yeah. the, the other things. But maybe to start off with, you can just give mm -hmm. us an idea, please, of what work work around impact means as opposed to work that is centered around tasks so just give us an idea of, of what your mm -hmm. definition of that is please thank you jane yeah so um i'm so excited to be here and i think you know this aspect of um how are we making work life 
livable <laughs> um, and to, to take those pieces around what are we doing and how is it having impact so that truly the aspect of careers look good here. Because as recruiters, that's one of our key jobs is to say, how are we helping people grow their careers? Because every chance, every opportunity that we have to recruit is a chance where someone was going to be changing their life. They're going to be changing their life significantly. They're going to be changing not only from the work that they get to do, but who they get to do it with and the reason why the organization exists and help bring it in there. And as we all as recruiters know, depending upon who gets the role, there can be a completely different mix than that happens for the team. And so it's always about that piece of how do we understand where is the where is the company going? Of course, what are we trying to go at that direction? But then also understanding what is the job now? How can the job develop? And how is that interplay between the different team members? How can that really create a boon? And so, and I think that that's that, Sometimes as recruiters, we got to, we have to pull ourselves back to say, why do we exist? This is a beautiful role that we have as kind of, I like to call it fiddler on the roof matchmakers. Uh, so we're the yentas in terms of we're creating these opportunities where people can come together and have a beautiful impact in terms of where they're taking their career and what they get to, they get to actually do. And so I think first and foremost, as recruiters, to that point of seeing it more than task, it's like, why does our role even exist? And what is that kind of that beauty that we bring through our special skills, our expertise, our networks that we have um, that really foster that? And so getting that a little bit into the mind gets then also to those pieces around the responsibility of how are we having sometimes those challenging intake conversations with the hiring manager? who gives you a laundry list <laughs> of things that they would want and where we're, we're pushing back and saying, okay, okay, but what's really, um, really the most important? What are the minimum criteria? And then how will someone evolve in this role? And quite often, um, I don't know, and I'd love to hear in the chat and as we talk later, is um, quite often the hiring managers are under the pressure of the right now. I have a whole this whole idea of workforce planning and that they know, and we're, we're going to have that nice lead time of six months to find those great candidates. Oftentimes it's, oh goodness, this person um, is no longer with us. Um, we need a person now. And so we get into the rush, rush, hectic. And so how are we taking, when we're looking for recruiting for impact to say, how are we having meaningful conversations around why does this role exist? How will this role evolve? Who will this person be working with and um, what kind of impact will this role have longer term? Because that helps us then in terms of how we recruit or how we source and speak to candidates as to how will this job be meaningful for you? And then also, as we look to those different criteria of what people can bring in, that we also speak specifically to, to those people. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, such a good point, Liz. And I think sometimes recruiters share that one of their biggest challenges is getting time from hiring mm. managers and from HR to get that yeah. amount of information. So often it's just, oh, here's a role. I've pulled it off the system. Just go find this person. <laughs> exactly. We created this job description for our union negotiations. What? Um, that's not enough. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, yeah. most people that I speak to have that have that talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and absolutely. I think it's so important for them to understand that they actually, you know, because it feels like oh, it takes too much time to have those conversations. But if you yeah. have those conversations, that will save you time later on in the process because it'll minimize your turnover. I mean, we hear people yeah. stay if there's a sense mm -hmm. of meaning and purpose and impact. And yeah. I know you're working in organizations, you see that. So can you tell yeah. us a little bit more around how you see people being retained through mm -hmm. meaning and through purpose and through having that career growth? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Wonderful question, Jane. And I think, so for me, one of my pivotal kind of studies that I quite often reference was 2018 um, Imperative, which is a really awesome company, which really looked in at focus, uh, focused in on purpose and purpose and meaning in organizations. 
they did a study together with PwC around what is it that really makes people thrive um, and feel fulfilled. So they they moved away from employee engagement um, and employee satisfaction to this aspect of what does fulfillment mean? And fulfillment is really around what that the impact in terms of there's actual meaning and relevance for the work that you get to do. And there's some sort of result that you can see. It looks at growth in terms of, and I'm not talking about title or growth. Um, as we go into flatter organizations, we know that that's not something that's happening as much as it used to, but really around what do you actually get to do? Um, how do you, how are you growing in terms of your skill expertise, competency development? So that growth aspect, um, and then the third part of um, fulfillment is really around relationships, around what are those relationships that you have at work um, and who do you get to interact with um, on a peer, but also in terms of expertise and the people you get to learn with. Um, and so those three elements around impact um, and fulfillment, that goes back to your question around how you make it meaningful at work. And so if those three things are what people are looking for. What's your story around that? And that it's not just a, a branding story of we wish it really looked like this, but it's not. But really, what is that? How do you get that real experience of working in with those teams? Because um, that's the fun piece is, you know, we always have time for quality spills, but how do we avoid those quality spills? So to your point of turnover, of how are we investing the time and really thinking of roles beyond kind of those tasks, I think that's one of those key critical areas uh, to be able to have impact as, as a recruiter and as a team is thinking about how does the work play out and what do people get to do? Mm. Well, I love that, Liz. And I think what really struck me is mm -hmm. when you talk about relationships, and of course, yeah. in this situation, we're talking about how do we attract people in the world of the war for talent, not the war for mm -hmm. jobs, which is a yeah. sad reality, in, especially in South Africa. Yeah. But if we're in recruitment, then we're usually trying to find the person who doesn't always want to be found. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I Absolutely. do find that sometimes, you know, there has been a shift and maybe people are looking more at, okay, what is the impact of this role? But as you say, take the time with the hiring manager and HR to extract that. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking about the interviews and when we interview okay. yeah. candidates and applicants for roles, mm -hmm. sometimes what I've heard from some leading kind of, you know, call them headhunters for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. is they've said they're no longer finding that it's enough to say to somebody, um, you know, what are you looking for in your new role or why did you leave? Because often the answer mm -hmm. is growth. And so what they're doing now is saying, okay, but just paint us a picture of what growth looks like. So nice. Mm -hmm. in two to three years time, if you were to say I've grown, mm -hmm. what would that look mm -hmm. like? Yeah. The people are starting to do that more, but where I think there's still a gap is that part about relationships. Yes, How absolutely. Mm -hmm. probing what were your relationships like in your yep. past working environment? Mm -hmm. What did you like, not like, need, not need? And really matching that relational aspect and not just the work of so. career growth. I love that. Mm -hmm. No, th thank you. And I think it's so integral because I think, you know, we talk a lot about workplace toxicity and what it takes to kind of heal from bad socialization. And this piece around, you know, what are the relationships that you have at work, how you feel supported, how you've seen, how, you, how you're recognized. And how you truly collaborate, um, that makes a huge difference. Are you are things being thrown over a wall? Do you have are you constantly having to defend yourself and think about the tactics that our others are using? That's extremely debilitating. And so this aspect of, you know, here, um, careers look good here means the people that you're working together with um, is a huge boon to, to how you actually get to work and enjoy your work. Um, so, and to your point about the war of talent, I'm part of the TB, the Talent Brand Alliance. And so getting an insight from others, you know, particularly around hard fought talent, this one woman was talking about a, um, a candidate who had 28 different offers on the table. 28. <laughs> 28. I'm like, wow, that's insane. 
<laughs> that's like how many wrecks we have to work. Um, but, uh, and so this, it was truly the aspect of, you know, they had a one pager and part of that one pager was the people that they got to work with. And so this aspect of lighthouse talent, it's really around who do I get to learn and glean and what, what projects, not only what projects will I be involved with, but who's going to be involved in those projects together with me? Um, and so thinking about that out of those lenses of how does growth happen? And um, I say the best teams are kind of like a scavenger hunt where you build upon the ideas of one another and where that aspect of really co-creating something awesome, those are the levers. Those are the ones that, um, you know, because at some point when you have 28 offers, the, the aspect of compensation, that's not going to be the lever because you're probably going to be able to get the comp you want. But what you won't necessarily get is the same type of what, what do you get to work on? Who do you get to work with? And um, what will be the impact of what you guys will be doing together? No, that's so true, Liz. I mean, if you've got 28 offers, you probably are not working for money anymore. <laughs> that's a really like extended like pro con list and like pivo tables and all sorts of things. <laughs> but even the, even the clients and the corporates that I've been engaging with this year have been sharing that they they used to feel that they were quite secure in their position mm. that if they made an offer to someone, that person would accept. Yeah. And yeah. they don't feel that any longer. Mm -hmm. They now are experiencing some of them for the first time that somebody is rejecting an offer or kind of coming to the table with their requirements as an applicant and not saying, well, what are your requirements from me? If you want me, here's how I would. Well, and, it, and it's so mind-blowing. And I think that that's one of the challenges is we, in, in terms of HR and talent, acquisition have had a kind of a supply chain, this, this funnel type of idea that we look at, I call it talent on a napkin. Um, what is the talent we have? What do we talent do we need? And then what talent do we have tomorrow? The beautiful Venn diagram. And where I've been talking to my clients and it really truly echoes what you've been saying is what happens in the middle, which is what does the talent want and need from work? And how are we including that? And, and really for the most part, for most processes, that talent want and need hasn't been part of our lens. And so it started a couple of years ago when we started talking about user experience and candidate experience, but oftentimes it was about the process flow rather than, okay, um, but what are they really, and how quickly they could get through, but really looking at it out of that lens of fulfillment and how are we speaking to those? And how are we looking at our own stories of the impact that we have at work and talking to those things? It's creating a, I'll, I'll say perhaps a little bit more balanced. Um, and this is why when I always talk to, to candidates or people who are looking to change roles, it's like the company has to sell themselves to you too as well. You know, it's not this one-sided um, kind of, please, 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 please take me. Where, you know, and it's hard because that's been our paradigm for so many years. And now that it's shifting, it's also the, the confrontation, I'll just use that word, for companies as well as um, people who have been used to um, people just automatically saying yes when there's an offer on the table, having to do a pause and rethink um, towards, okay, how are we actually looking at what a person gets to do, who they're doing it with? so that we can talk honestly and authentically as to, to the candidate that they can see it as truly as an option. Mm, yeah, no, exactly, Liz. And I think when you, when you mentioned process, um, mm. <laughs> I actually have somebody who shared this morning, she was approached by a potential employer that she normally, you know, she really respect this organization. Mm -hmm. She felt quite flattered when they approached her and they set up an interview and they have now canceled this interview three times. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it's just their process. Yeah. But she said mm -hmm. to me this morning, it, I mean, it's no longer flattering and it's no longer attractive. In fact, at this stage, she feels embarrassed on their part. Yes. Yes. She's like, yes. Is yes, yes, yes. Now or later? Or, or what should I? I mean, it's just like awkward. It's but, awkward. And yeah. And it's such an, an excuse that gets used is this process. 
Um, one of my clients, we had uh, together with the HR team, we had had, you know, to that point, we had um, candidate profiles that were in the system three months, three months before the callback or any sort of initiation from the team. And me and the, the CHR and we're like, how can we get this through to the HR directors and HR managers who are not part of the recruiting team as to what this means? Because our recruiters were going crazy trying to schedule. They were the ones being, to, you know, oh, don't have time, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it was really terrible for the employer brand. And so we took everybody through a restaurant experience based upon, so we had like the waiting time, you know, here we see you, we greet you. And then, you know, we never come to your table to take your order or, and then we take your order. Um, we come back with, um, something completely different, serve you something completely different or not come back at all, bring you a drink of water. Um, but not your regular, and it was really fun, but we, and, but in the debrief, we were able to match one-on-one -on -one what the HR directors and managers experienced in our restaurant simulation to what we were doing to candidates. And so it really then helped internally to say, okay, how do we have like a war room and, you know, kind of like the agile system for going about and how are we prioritizing? How are we putting, before we put a candidate profile out, how do we have those interview times already slotted on the calendar so that the process does not get in the way of an actual great hire? But um, Liz, I think just with the, so we were talking about how, you know, people get attracted or not attracted or put off the experience um, through the process. But when you are speaking to companies and asking them to set up an, an environment that is one that is going to attract people who are looking mm -hmm. for impact because that is what yeah. people are looking for at the moment. Mm -hmm. How do what what do you tell them or how do you advise them? What tips do you give? So first thing is I interview the people themselves and say why do you work here? And mm -hmm. quite often um, there's been there, you know some people started out their career and they've always worked at that place. So it's in essence. It's a challenge to say, you know, you do have a choice. What are the things that you like around working here? Even if you've worked here for 20 years, you still have options about what really makes this place special. Um, and then, so first getting them to challenge to think out of that lens is a great place to start. Um, on the end, then going further and saying, okay, what are, what are competitors? What are, what are the professional associations? What do they say about your talent? What are those stories that they share in working with you or having people from your company? What are those impressions that they have? Mm -hmm. um, both positive and negative. So to say, okay, what are those negative pieces back to the talent brand that we can actually work on? Um, and taking that feedback um, and, and then speaking to how are we constructively actually taking that, that input and making things better or celebrating the great things about an organization and speaking to those with real stories. Mm. So, but I think the first aspect is getting people to think out of their own lens. Why do I work here? Mm. Yeah. Because, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We all yeah. have choices. And so it's that choice of um, even if there are financial or economic drivers, you can you still make a choice as to where you bring your effort in um, rather than um, I've always just done it. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I love what you're talking about, Liz, when it comes to storytelling, because mm -hmm. that's what really ignites a human mm -hmm. Yeah, and absolutely. It's so important to people, you know, when people are interviewing, I always mm -hmm. advise someone to start with their story and inspire yeah with why they work there and not just give the facts yeah because we yeah. share the story we create that human connection mm -hmm. I love absolutely that. i yeah. love that yeah so then we can imagine working together with these people and if you're unclear about your own story as to why do you work there it it becomes more plastic when you just read the the ci the corporate identity marketing like blurb um, it doesn't seem real because, uh -huh. you know, everybody has a great team environment. Everyone has um, passion for excellence and everyone has quality first. I mean, these are not differentiators. The, the aspect is um, 
who you get to work with and can you imagine having this person as a colleague mm, yeah exactly mm. yeah and just speaking to that i think sometimes um you know i was i was speaking to lz for me who's not here right now but we were working on some content for an advertising workshop because people kept asking for advertising as opposed to sourcing mm-hmm. but a lot of companies feel like their ads are stale and they're not, you know, like they have this job. But I'm just also wondering what advice you have for people who are wanting to create an advertisement or a job description that is written mm-hmm. in such a way that it inspires people to see the impact in that role. Because mm-hmm. you can talk about it, but what about when people read it? I love so I'm just it. Wondering, well, yeah, what do you think about that? I think you gave the you gave the clue already is have them tell a story mm-hmm. and then use that story that they tell about how will the job have impact where is that how is the person how is what do they get to do and create that you know instead of that laundry list of like you get to use s ap and run these reports <laughs> yay um ra- rather than to to truly look at what do you get to do in that story tell Yes, yes, exactly. No, I love that, Liz. And so with your work around the globe, um, because you're always, you know, speaking to people in different countries and um, at different times, different time zones, are there any trends that you've seen in certain parts of the world or any global trends that you've seen around recruiting for impact as opposed to being task driven? I think, um, great question. And I'd love to hear the insights from, from people uh, here in this room and especially Van, because the what I've been noticing in the different groups that I've been in is really, um, A, people are exhausted coming out of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And this aspect of how are we actually seeing the challenges of we're what two and a half years in and there are other additional social challenges that we're going through at the same time so how are we truly looking and seeing a people-centric organization of um, breathing room breathing time mental health being a big key there uh Mm -hmm. so people are really you can maybe have a, got a lot of good lip speak. You know, we used to like say uh, an organizational environment and a team environment is not just because we have a pool table. That was the kind of Lapida um, 2019 talk to it. I think now the trend is really um, what are those, those options around taking care of the whole self? So mm-hmm. like you and I talked at the L&D Care Summit back in um back in September about your your vulnerability, your vitality and your viability are so intertwined. Mm -hmm. And now the fourth V of velocity of how long can we sustain it? So companies that truly meaningfully have um, benefits in regards to how do we take care of your whole self at work and really have it built into how we work and not just looking at um, hourly and um, and kind of the yeah the the typical frameworks of how of work but really thinking more considered flexible benefits how are we truly taking care of the whole people how do we raise the flags when people are exhausted and pre-burnt out um, rather than perhaps taking care of them afterwards, which is very important, but also what are we proactively doing as organizations and as companies to to truly seeing the well-being of our people as a longer term um, DNA element? Yeah, I love that, Liz, and I think that is an attractive element is yeah. what do you do to prevent and not just mm-hmm. to treat. Yeah. Before we open it up, I just want to ask you one more question because it's, I love your insights on this, is for all of us, for people who are in work and in a flow of work Mm -hmm. right now ourselves, um, I know you always have good advice and insights around how do we ourselves make sure that we continue to work with a sense of impact and not get caught up in being task driven. So any insights? Advice, thoughts there. 
I, I yeah, I mean, me on my mountain. No, I, it, it is hard. It gets hard that, the, you know, to really always focus on the things that matter most must never be at the mercy of the things that matter least. So the famous quote that we all know, how do we? So really taking that, um, I was just at a training and they said, you know, here, what is the main idea and what are those three supporting bullet points? And having that your frame of reference of how are you looking to the things that you're working on? How do they fit that main idea in those three bullet points? And doing a weekly kind of check and planning. I know much others are much better at time locking <clears throat> than me. Um, but I think finding those times and resources around your own energy as to how do you go after those main point and those top three bullets, that can help as you calibrate yourself as to, am I, I'll just talk about me, am I spending way too time, much time on this job aid um, and making it pretty um, versus what I perhaps really need to be doing, like maybe tax preparation or things like that. And so, you know, you're calling yourself to the mat yourself as to how am I choosing to spend my time, what's really important here. Mm -hmm. And then on the Friday, being okay that that post it with all of the things you wanted to do on your on during your week that there's going to be a few that definitely did not get crossed off and being okay with that yeah no i love that Liz. and i think it also talks to being able to live and inspire others with your story so mm -hmm. if you're recruiting for impact you need to be able to share how you're you're living that yourself so thank you yeah yeah absolutely and, and i think I think it's having those meaningful conversations and taking the time and understanding that slow down to speed up truly is something that will help you. And I think that that's where, when I go into the discussions with people that they're like, well, I can't do that. I have, you know, 28 recs, I can't slow down to speed up. And it's like, no, seriously, you can, because you'll be more effective at what you're doing. And the aspect of how do we look at the quality of candidates versus the quantity? How do we push back in a positive way when you know our hiring manager says, oh, these, these five candidates that you've like wrung your hair out and have a couple gray hairs to get these great candidates, they're, they're not who we need. We get me more candidates. Mm -hmm. So having that aspect of how are we really slowing down to speed up, having meaningful impact conversations when the people making with the people making the decisions. And then keeping those, those high touch points of just informing where people are in the process and those next steps, those can truly help. And there's, yes, there's automated pieces that you can do and you can make it personal, but having those touch points on relationships to really understand where we are, manage those expectations. This is that slow down to speed up that really helps us recruit for more impact. Hmm. Oh, love it. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for sharing your time, your expertise, oh, your so wisdom, much. your insights from all over the world. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the Australian call this week from 1 a.m. to 3.30. Yeah, um, but it was awesome. It was great. And, you know, those, those aspects around for them, it was also... How do we help those next stages of leaders be, you know, how are we as a leadership team of CEOs sponsoring those who are coming next and that meaningful role? I was so touched. And so I think this, this whole kind of leadership story of we're all, we're all in progress and we're all in process and how can we continue to help one another grow? Um, I think it is becoming a major trend and I couldn't be more excited about it. So. Mm. 1 a.m. to 3.30 a.m. if you need me for those things, totally here for it. <laughs> no, no, thanks, Liz. Thank you.